All right, good morning. Did, so everybody got one of those invitations, correct? The blue ones? If you do, can you hold it up? Because I want you to know something. Take a good look at that invitation and say, this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the person whom God puts on your heart to invite to the celebration next week. So that is for someone else. And right now you're looking at me and you're thinking, who is this guy talking to me? I had a little mishap at the barber this week. Yes, so I'm Pastor Aaron's younger brother. I'm Daron. Daron. Um, yeah, so he didn't even ask me. He just started going, 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 and pretty soon he had half of it off, and I'm like, well, you can't, you can't stop now. We've got to go for the whole thing. So I just want you guys to know that it's really cold. I can feel that now. I don't feel that all the time, but it's definitely, and I can run faster now which is to say I made it all the way to like two and a half miles an hour when I run, so this is good. All right, will you please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. We are not going to do the next section of our verse-by-verse study in Second Peter, which has been a great study, but we're going to take a little detour this morning because as we've come together after the hurricane, I just felt like talking to you about false teachers somehow didn't fit the day. So we are taking a little detour to Matthew chapter 14. The title of our message is called Lessons from the Storm. Lessons from the Storm. Well, out in the Arizona desert, a film crew had been working for a few weeks shooting a movie. One day, one of the local Indians wandered into the set, and the director noticed him and looked over, and he smiled, and the Indian said to him, it's going to rain tomorrow. And sure enough, when they came back the, next, the following day to shoot, it was raining. I thought, well, that was remarkable. And about three days later, the same Indian walked into their film crew again and walked up to the director and says, tomorrow there's going to be a storm. And sure enough, the next day there was a storm. Well, a week went by and the Indian didn't come and the director was getting a little bit worried because he had a big shoot that was coming up, and he really needed to know whether it was going to be dry or rainy. So pretty soon, he sent his assistant to find this Indian and said, let's hire this guy and bring him in so that we can be sure that we have a dry day to shoot our scene. Well, a day goes by, and the assistant finally comes up with the same local Indian and walks him up to the director, and the director says, I've got a huge shoot tomorrow. It's very big, very costly. I need to know, is it going to rain tomorrow? The Indian shrugged his shoulders, and he said, I don't know. My radio's broken. It's about how it went for the last week from us getting the weather, isn't it? Lessons from the storm. You know, this is my fourth major hurricane that I've ridden out since my wife and I moved to Florida, since we started the church. And each time we go through a hurricane, I learn a little bit more. The year after we moved here was Irma, if you remember that one. And then, of course, there was Ian. We can't forget that one. And then two weeks ago, it was Helene, and and now it is Milton. So four major hurricanes. Now that I've been through four, though, I'm beginning to recognize certain patterns. Number one, if they say it's going to hit Tampa, (laughs) put on your shutters, fill up your gas cans, and prepare for the hurricane to hit you. Turns out, Whenever they think it's going to hit Tampa, it's always going to hit us. Um, I also learned that hurricane weight is a real thing. Hurricane weight is a real thing. When we were preparing for our hurricanes, we, we, we always, I said, well, let's prepare for about two weeks without power. So my wife goes to Costco and, um, and comes back with a dishwashing rack. I'm not sure what that was going to be used for, but... She came back with two weeks worth of food. She got us plenty of food and good stuff too, and I was super happy. By the way, I've got about nine pounds of bacon in my freezer I'm super happy about. Yes, she's like, I want you to be happy. I'm like, I, <laughs> you know me well. <laughs> but hurricane weight is a real thing because on day one, by midnight, I was already into my fifth day of rations. 
And that's because you're sitting around watching the news and eating food the whole time. And before you know it, you know, you're, you're down three T-bones and, a, and, a, and three pounds of bacon. I did have help. I mean, I had help. Like Robin had a slice, I think. I'm pretty sure the dog stole some off my plate. But The third thing I learned is that the hurricane is most certainly not the only storm whenever there's a hurricane. We learned that there's a fear storm that's piled upon us through the media and through politicians. The media looking for ratings has been building up and each hurricane, after the hurricane, I get more frustrated about that. There were three major buzzwords that were used this season and there's one, the, the one new one was part of the three. We've learned that they use biblical proportions. Biblical. No, I'm sorry, it's not biblical. That, that one flooded the whole earth, not just Punta Gorda. The next one is unprecedented. Unprecedented, without precedent. I'm sorry, but we get hit by hurricanes every summer. There most certainly is a precedent. And the last one is unsurvivable. Unsurvivable, you know they use the graphic where they showed the water coming up and the guy standing in it. Oh, I'm six feet tall and that water is 12 feet over my head. <sighs> really? Is it unsurvivable? Because we get hit by hurricanes every year and everyone, you know, most everyone survives. Now listen, there are people and there are deaths that happen, but when they build it up and they say it's not survivable, that indicates that no one will survive and politicians are grandstanding about how much they love you and, you know, and, and local news weathermen are talking to you like you're trying. Listen, guys, hurricanes happen, don't they? We, it's the price for paradise and we ride them out and we go through it. And if you have the ability, you go someplace else and you have a little mini vacation. If you're lucky, you come back and everything is still intact and we praise God. But you know what? The biggest thing about storms that we ride through in life is that they have a real parallel to our lives. Because hurricanes are not the only storms we go through. You have a diagnosis that leads to potentially major consequences for you or your family. That's a storm. You have something go wrong. You get fired from a job or your company goes under or the economy tanks. That's a storm. You're going through something difficult in your life, a relationship issue, that's a storm. So the same lessons that we learn from the storms that we go through apply to our life. And we're going to read this morning about the disciples getting caught in a particular storm on the Sea of Galilee. And we are going to draw three biblical lessons from the storm written here in Matthew chapter 14. So if your Bible's open, read with me. I said 14, yes, verse 22, I'm sorry, verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Let's pause here and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this awesome day, Lord. We thank you for... This house, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for protecting this house. As we came here, Lord, and there was just, there was barely any damage to the building at all, and this poor building has been through some pretty big storms over the last few years. Father, all of us have been through these storms, and our nerves are frayed, but we're here today, Lord. We're here in your house, feeling, Lord, your love, your comfort, and your peace. So I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us this morning, encourage our, our hearts, as now we have the long days of cleanup ahead. And we pray these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. So, in the book of Matthew, Matthew's goal here is to show that Jesus is the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Matthew was Jewish, and he wrote his, his gospel primarily to a Jewish audience. And so he draws back to a lot of Old Testament prophets and the scriptures prophesying that the Messiah will come, and he connects them with Jesus. And he's telling these stories and moving through um, kind of quickly the life of Jesus. And we just, and just prior to this, if you were to read chapter 14, we have the story where Jesus fed 5,000 people. And Matthew tells us that in this moment, because he provided food for 5,000, and it turns out if you provide free food for 5,000, especially seafood, you make a lot of friends. Now this miracle that had been wrought was so impressive and so exciting that the people wanted to make Jesus king right then and there. The Mark's gospel tells a parallel story of this, and that's what he says. He says the people were pushing against Jesus and they wanted to make him king, and Jesus needed to do something about this. Number one, because his moment had not come yet, 
But number two, possibly because his disciples were getting washed up in the excitement and wanting to make him king as well. And so it says here in verse 22, it says immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat. That word made is literally compelled, okay? Um, The word in Greek is so strong, think of this as like trying to put a two-year-old in a car seat that doesn't want to leave, right? You, you, you want, you're telling them it's time to go, it's time to go, they're kind of throwing the fill. I don't want to go, I want to stay, and so on and so forth. This was kind of what happened here. The disciples were getting washed up into the excitement of the day. And so Jesus tells him, no, you're going, you're getting in the boat, and he says he made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, perhaps you've seen pictures of the Sea of Galilee, um, it's, it's actually a lot like Charlotte Harbor. It's not the same shape, but it's roughly the same size. And it sits between, uh, it sits in the valley between these two mountain ranges, and the wind comes down from the north, from the, the area of Lebanon and Syria. The wind comes down, and when it gets into this valley, it like, it, it accelerates. And so, um, it can be a bright, blue, blue, sunny sky day on the Sea of Galilee, and everything is fine, and then within 15 minutes, there's waves, it's craziness, and I actually experienced this. I, not on the, not on the, on the lake, but it's actually a big freshwater lake, by the way, when it says Sea of Galilee. Um, I was on the shoreline, I was staying at a hotel, uh, in, uh, right on the shore, and I'd wake, you'd wake up every morning and the windows faced the Sea of Galilee and you could eat your breakfast there. It was, it was so beautiful, it was so nice. And in the morning I had my breakfast and it was just beautiful out there. And I was just admiring it and just kind of praying and, and just enjoying my time there. and and. I went back up to my room and we went out and toured and we came back for lunch. When we came back for lunch, I looked out and I thought, ooh, it's a good thing I'm not out there. And and our tour guide says, yeah, this happens all the time here. Well, the disciples were fishermen on that lake. They knew that lake. They knew it very well. Storms whipped up. But this particular storm was different because Jesus not only made them get in the boat, he says, you guys need to go, go before me to the side. He says, you do that, I'm gonna send the multitudes away so he sent the disciples out so that they could get out of there, but number, t- number two, he sent them out so he could spend some time with the Lord. It says, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now this is kind of funny when you think about Jesus praying. <laughs> but Jesus stayed in constant contact with the Father. He spent his time in prayer and it was very valuable to him. Any major ministry that's bearing any real spiritual fruit is always bathed and began in prayer. It has its prayer as its foundation. Jesus is that example. So he sends them off to pray. Now the disciples, it says, when evening had came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now Mark's gospel tells us that when Jesus was up on this mountain, he could see down, and by the way, it's just, it's a really big hill. It's not really a mountain. Don't think of like the Cascade mountain range, Um, but it's really a large hill, And, and if you've ever been there, we go up on this hill, and from the top of these hills, you can see easily down to the Sea of Galilee. And at night, the boats oftentimes have lights on them so that they can see, so you can see the lights on the lake. So Jesus is up on top of the hilltop, and he's praying, and he can look down, and he can see his disciples down there in the boat, but they're only out in the middle of the lake. And by the way, um, once again, if you've ever seen the Sea of Galilee, it shouldn't take you that long to row to the other side. If you think about Charlotte Harbor, if you wanted to row a boat to the other side, if, if, you know, if you're capable at rowing a boat, you could probably get there in, what, an hour, maybe? But if there's a storm and you're trying to row against the waves, that's a long night. It says here that they were out there, it says it was when evening came, so, so they left. They've been out there for several hours rowing, working hard, and not really going anywhere. They're only out in the middle of the lake, and that's the worst possible place to be because if you turn around, you still have half the lake to go. It might be easier if you're not going into the wind, but Jesus said, I'll meet you on the other side. And so that was their destination. They're rowing against the waves. And you can just imagine if you're in that boat, probably getting extremely frustrated. Fisherman, tax collector, religious zealot who wants to take over the government, right-wing conspiracy theorist, some might say. These guys are all in the boat and, and they, they're, they're now handling a little bit of adversity together. You can imagine what that would have been like on the boat, right? 12 men, all different personalities of different backgrounds and trades, and things aren't going very well. How long do you think it was before the first comment came out? Hey, Peter and John, I thought you guys were fishermen. You said you guys knew this lake. All right, Matthew, why don't you get over here and row, tax collector? (laughs) Maybe somebody owes you money on the other side. 
you can imagine the bickering began. These guys are out there. So let me pause here and just speak into your life just a little bit. Have you ever been through something and you're tired and it's going on for a long time and you don't feel like you're making any headway? That happens, doesn't it? Trials always last longer than you want them to because we don't like trials at all. No one wants to be in a trial. We don't want to have a hurricane here. Nevertheless, they happen. We don't want the news to whip it up and terrify everybody, including all of our family members that live up north that have no idea what a hurricane really is. But they happen. And when they happen, and we pray, and we don't immediately see God come in and fix our problem, it can be discouraging, and it can be hard. And the first thing I want you to notice about this is that they were 100% perfectly in God's will. That's weird to think, isn't it? They're 100% perfectly in God's will. What did Jesus say to them? He compelled them to get in the boat. Go get in the boat and go to the other side. Question, do you think Jesus knew there'd be a little storm that night? Yeah. Since he created the weather, I think he had a pretty good handle on when things were actually going to happen. And these disciples now are out there. Jesus compelled them. They obeyed Jesus' command, and yet they're still in a storm. And the reason why this was such a big point is because how often when we go through stuff, if it's not resolved quickly enough, do we start thinking, what did I do? <laughs> why, where, have I, where have I sinned? Where have I wrong that God is bringing this upon me? Two weeks ago when the hurricane went by, some of your houses flooded. And some, most of you, I think, we had crews from the church go over and we took all the belongings out of the house and the sheetrock and worked there were people who worked very, very hard and diff, you know, in difficult conditions without air conditioning to, to clean this stuff up. And then another hurricane came by and you got flooded again. And it was interesting because I heard the comments about the first one. Somebody had told me that in the 17 years of living, or excuse me, in the last 60 years of living here, they'd never seen a flood like that. And it happened twice. And now you've got to be thinking, what did I do to, to upset the God of all creation that he would bring this upon my life? It's discouraging to, to, to you know, well, it's discouraging even to, to think that you have to do it again. What's even more discouraging is that sometimes these storms come when you're perfectly in the will and walking in the obedience of God. Now, here's the thing. There's other people who have gone through things like this. In Mark chapter four, um, the disciples were in another storm. They were rowing across and Jesus was asleep in the boat and they were beginning to drown and they, they got upset and cried out to Jesus and said, hey, don't you care about us? We're perishing here. We're all gonna die. Jesus calmed that storm and kind of rebuked them on their lack of faith. First Peter 4.12 tells us not to be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon us as though something strange is happening to us because the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. We know of another guy named Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah had the same experience. Listen to this. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide at the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook that I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Just, did you hear that? Elijah has to go and proclaim a judgment on a sinful king and a sinful nation saying, there will be no rain or dew. You're gonna have a massive drought. And, but God turns to Elijah and says, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of you. You go to this cave, there's a freshwater brook, brook there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have the, the, the birds are gonna bring you bacon. So Elijah is there, and he's got to be feeling awfully special. Yeah, those people sinned, and they're getting what they deserve, but I wasn't sinful. I was righteous. I followed the Lord's command. I've obeyed. I've done what he, and now I've got, now I've got, you know, like this is a, what's that food delivery service that we have now? I forget what it's like, Uber, you know, Uber Eats, that's what it is. You know, he got Uber Eats coming, right, every day, and, you know, and he sends out a new order. Hey, Raven, see if you can find some, oh, I don't know, uh, steak. But now in verse five, 
So he did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. But listen to this, verse 7. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain on the land. If Elijah was now feeling the same thing the disciples felt. I've obeyed God, and now here I find myself in a desperate situation. Elijah was desperate. He was out in a cave. Ahab wants to kill him. The people of the land are, are blaming him for their problems, and now he's beginning to run out of water. You see, sometimes walking in God's will also equals hardship because rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. And I know you came here for encouragement today, and believe me, that's coming, but we need to understand that maybe these storms aren't by anything we did wrong, but rather maybe God has a purpose. So in our story in chapter 14, now in verse 25, it says, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is, it is I. Do not be afraid. Well, that's interesting. It, it says the fourth watch of the night. That means that it puts this between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So the disciples are still rowing. They're still not making any headway. They're still out in the middle of the sea. They know they obey Jesus, but by now you have to imagine the fear is beginning to creep in. The fear is beginning to creep in. Probably at this point they started maybe questioning themselves. Did, did Jesus really say, go get in the boat and go to the other side? Are you sure he didn't say, go get the boat so that we can go to the other side? Who's, who got the message anyway? Judas, it was you, wasn't it? Was trying to hurt people. I imagine that their radio was probably blasting out updates from their storm. It's unsurvivable. This is actually biblical because it's in the Bible. It's unprecedented. It's record breaking. These guys were probably listening to this the whole time, looking at Jim Cantor over on the shore at a resort in Galilee. He's in the, he's in the first floor and he's in the knee deep water sharing everybody how we're all gonna die. No doubt the fear was creeping in for the disciples in this moment. What's really cool though, is that at this fourth watch of the night, and by the way, this is, they, they have to be, and we can imagine rowing all night, being fearful, hoping that Jesus is going to do something. It says, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. This is incredible. Jesus comes to them where they are. Raise your hand if during the storm, maybe you prayed and, and maybe God brought you a little bit of peace. Maybe you prayed about something and and. God came through and protected you or protecting, you know, protected your house. And these disciples were fearful and Jesus knew that. Why? Because he could see them. Maybe Jesus had a plan and a, and a purpose in this pain. Maybe he sent them out fully knowing how exactly he was going to come to them. And, and I want to point out that when he came to them, the disciples didn't immediately recognize him. Did you see that? It says, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. Well, yeah, nobody had ever walked on the sea before. And by the way, in this culture, if a spirit came to you at night, it was always a scary, demonic thing. Um, happy spirits didn't show up in the middle of the night, and they knew that. In this culture, it was, very, it was demonic, basically. So they're out now, and what they thought was going to bring their doom ended up being Jesus. They didn't immediately recognize when Jesus came to them. Why? Because they weren't looking for a guy walking on the water. They were going to look for a guy on the other side of the shoreline, which they couldn't get to. So they're out in the middle, and Jesus comes, and they're terrified. But what does Jesus say? Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. 365 times in the Bible, it tells, we are told, not to have fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. There's one for every day of the week, or every, uh, yeah, every day of the, of the year. Do not fear, do not fear, it is I. So you can imagine now the disciples saw him coming. Here's, here's what's really cool. To the disciples, I'm sure it would have seemed like everything would have been fine had Jesus just gone over with them in the boat in the first place. If Jesus had followed their plan, they wouldn't have had it. If, if, if God would have answered some of our prayers, the hurricane never would have hit here at all. 
it would have gone from a five to a zero, and we would have all fist pumped and gone back to life. Nevertheless, God allowed the storm. Nevertheless, God allowed the disciples to go out in the storm. And when he came to them, they didn't immediately recognize him. This is a really neat point because Jesus is not only is he not late, but he oftentimes comes to us in ways that we don't immediately recognize. Jesus often comes to us in ways that we don't immediately recognize. You know, there's a couple of cool things that happened during the last storm. And Ian, two years ago, um, there was so much damage and there was so much destruction and people lost so much stuff. I saw something in that that, you know, sounds a little bit weird, but I did see it and I saw it in people. I saw so many people who lost their belongings later on come to this realization that, hey, you know what, that was a good thing. I lost my stuff, but now I recognize that it's just stuff. Like my, my, my purpose on this earth is not to gather up and work hard for as much stuff as I can. Jesus' purpose for my life is to be holy and to prepare me for the next life in which all of our stuff is up there. This is why he says, you know, store up your riches in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy. Do not store up your treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and hurricanes. If your hope is in stuff, well then, I'm sorry, but I'm kind of glad the storm came because we need to have perspective that what's important in this life is not stuff. We shouldn't hold on to the things. Did you know, and here's a, here's, here's a cool groundbreaking sort of truth for all of us to arrive to today. Did you know that at the end of the Bible it tells us that everything on this earth is gonna burn up? It's gonna burn up. I know a guy who had a, a really nice restored uh, 55, I think it was a 55 Chevy. And it was a beautiful car, just beautiful. He had it all restored and he didn't drive it very much. And he drove it one day to the store. It was kind of one of those cars he drove on the weekends. And he drove it to the store. And on his way back, and this was before cell phones, by the way, on his way back, he was sitting at a stoplight and somebody wasn't paying attention and hit his bumper, back of it. Now, if it had been his regular driver, he wouldn't have been all that good Christian guy. You know, he would have been like, okay, whatever. But it wasn't his regular driver. It was something he poured a lot of time and effort and focus into. And he's got a massive dent. Now, this isn't the kind of car you just replace. You don't just take it to your local body shop. I mean, this was a 55 Chevy with all original parts. You can't get those parts anymore. And so he was so upset and frustrated. And he got at home and he, and he parked in the driveway and he just stood out there and he was just about ready to tear up when his son came out and he says, hey, Dad, didn't you tell me everything's going to burn up anyway? Right? Hashtag perspective. Yeah. It is, and he said, in that, in that moment, I laughed, and I smiled to myself, and I said, that's right. I enjoy the stuff while I have it, but this doesn't define me. Jesus defines me. My, my home in heaven defines me. Perhaps storms like this help us to let go of our stuff, but we also must be reminded that for every pain, there's a purpose. Jesus already knew he was gonna walk out to the disciples on water. Why would he choose to walk on the water and not just appear in the boat, or just calm the storm. He wanted to show them that he can do things that nobody else can do and that if they depend and they, they put their faith in Jesus, whatever he asks them to do, he'll give them power for it. And it doesn't matter what they feel like they're gonna lose and, and I just find it so interesting. I know I said this already but I wanna repeat it. What they thought was their doom, they're already out in the store and now the ghosts are attacking them, right? I, 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 when I read that, I kind of started laughing. I thought, they thought it was a ghost. Here they are, upset, they're rowing against the storm, they're getting worried, we're not gonna make it, we might all drown, and now there's a ghost. As if hurricanes aren't bad enough, now they come with tornadoes, right? And I thought, okay, what's next? Are there gonna be sharks with laser beams attached to their heads, swimming up and starting to you know, shoot like Star Wars into town, or what? But what they thought was their doom ended up being their savior. What they thought was gonna kill them ended up being a blessing. So Jesus comes, and, and these, are, these are where the scriptures come into our minds and our hearts that we need to memorize and we need to have written on the tablet of our hearts. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Their plans to prosper you. Their plans to give you hope in a future, not to destroy you. Romans eight twenty eight is one we oftentimes refer to. 
All things work out for good for those who love uh, Jesus and are called according to his purpose. If you love him and you're called according to his purpose, guess what? There's a promise that every pain has a purpose. And Jesus isn't going to be late, even if you've been rowing the boat, even if it's gone on for far longer, even if you're in perfect will of God and you're going through a storm, these are promises for you. The last point we get to is that the key to peace is Jesus himself. I love this. In verse 28, Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. (laughs) I, I don't know what compelled Peter to do this. Other than, you know, like, I feel like I would have been Peter. I feel like this is the disciple that I most identify with. Why? Because if, you know, if, if Jesus, I don't know, if Jesus would have like hit the biggest triple on the motocross track and I would have been like, Jesus, command me to do that, right? If Je- you know, whatever he's doing, Peter, Peter looks at, he's walking on water. All the rest of the disciples are terrified. Oh, it's Jesus. We now feel good about things. And Peter's like, hey, can I do that? So Jesus says, Come. And when Peter had gotten out of the boat, he walked out on the water and go to Jesus. Now, this is really cool. Why? Because in the scriptures, we now have only two people who have ever walked on water. Jesus and Peter. Only two. How many disciples were there? There were 12. That meant there were 11 guys with their hands on the side of the boat being like, hey, let's see if he sinks first. (laughs) Nobody else got out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat. Peter had the faith and the trust in Jesus that if he commanded him to do something, and that's what Peter was asking him to do, command me to do it. I want to do what you're doing. I want to do that. Command me to do it. Jesus says, you're commanded. Come out. He gave them a power, and he's now walking on the waves. First biblical mention of surfing, by the way. (laughs) You know he did it, right? The waves came. He's like, "Woo!" you know, all the way down. This is great. But then something happened. Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Now, there's only two people who have walked on water and only one of them that went kerplunk. Peter. Peter began to sink. Why did he begin to sink? Because he saw the wind and the waves. How did he walk on water in the first place? Faith and obedience in Jesus. What caused him to sink? Fear, looking at the wind and the waves. His eyes went from, the, went from Jesus to the problem. Put your eyes on Jesus, the problem is different. Put your eyes on Jesus, you walk on water. Put your eyes on fear and you drown. This is a great point, why? Because if you live in Florida and you're now not moving back to Michigan, and you're gonna stay here, I hate to break this to you, especially right after a hurricane, but guess what? We're going to have another hurricane someday. I hope that 20 years goes by and we don't have to think about it for a long time. But I hope that after Ian, I said, we paid our dues. Why do we have to keep paying them? But it's the price. It it happens. It's the weather systems. We live in Florida. This is what happens in tropical places. There are storms. They're going to happen again. And when when they come... I want you to make your decision. Who are you going to listen to and what are you going to put your faith in? That's a real question. Because, I, listen, I'm bringing this up to you because this is something that I struggle with. It's my responsibility to take care of my family and make decisions that are not going to put them in harm's way. So we made the decision to stay during this one. And, you know, my wife was afraid. I'll say that. And I was perfectly confident until after the fourth time she asked me again, and I'm just like, man, I don't know now. I'm just kind of getting a little worried. (laughs) I thought it was good, but you keep asking me, so now I'm not. But we were a little bit afraid, and so what did I do? You know, you can just picture the scene. I did what most all of you did. I sat in my recliner, and I watched the news, and I had nothing but candy wrappers and plates sitting next to my chair. (laughs) My biggest problem wasn't the storm surge, it was working off the, the, the weight after the storm. And I began to notice something. I had, you know, because when I study in my, my, I've got a recliner at home and I've got a little coffee table next to it, and there I always sit my Bible and my notebook because I will study and I will do my work right there because it's comfortable and, and sometimes the girls are gone and I've got a quiet house and it's just easier for me to study when I don't have distractions. And there's my Bible, there's my notebook. 
And yet here's the computer and I thought to myself, it's been like eight hours, where have I been all day long? I've been watching the fear, I've been hearing biblical proportions and unprecedented, unsurvivable, write your name on your wrist so that we can identify your dead body in the ocean. Really? I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse, but we chose to stay and, and the reason we chose to stay is that I just feel like that I was more needed here, right? Um, and, and, you know, I'm somewhat young and able-bodied and I was pretty sure I can survive water. And so we stayed. And funny because there were definitely moments where I was sitting there questioning my life's decisions. I was questioning whether or not this was it. Man, I've got, I've got my wife and girl. And I kept trying to say, well, Robin, if you're afraid, I'll you know, go to the other. We have, you have places to go. She's like, well, you're coming. I'm like, no, I'm not. So I'm going to stay here. But then we kind of had this, well, I'm not going if you're not going. Okay, great. Then let's put on some life jackets and keep the boat ready in the garage. But seriously, though, it, it's challenging to maintain that peace when the fear is working against you, isn't it? It's challenging to maintain that peace, but this is such a perfect picture of where we ought to be. When, when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank. And the fear and the anxiety, it overwhelmed him. And he needlessly worried, or, you know, he needlessly, well, the, the, the one good thing he did was he cried out to Jesus even when he sank. You know, the shortest prayer in the Bible, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And what did Jesus do? Let's just read the rest of this passage. He says here in verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Oh, what was it? It was doubt that killed him. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. In Mark's gospel, it's recorded that they said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? So Jesus ultimately did bring the storm to a perfect calm. Jesus ultimately did get in the boat with them and they did get to the other side. So what is the object lesson here? The object lesson is, is that sometimes storms come even when you're walking in the obedience of God, that even when you're praying and it's not stopping right away, that Jesus has a plan and a, and, and a, and a purpose for your pain. Look for Jesus to come to you because sometimes you don't always recognize when he comes to you. Like when people from the church want to come and they want to work at your house, don't refuse them. It's their blessing to serve and you may not recognize it, but that's Jesus coming to you. And not only that, but if you don't have peace and you're filled with anxiety, then my question to you would be, where are your eyes? What are you focused on? If you focus on the world, you'll feel oppressed. If you focus on yourself, you'll get depressed. If you put your eyes on Jesus, you'll be impressed. And life changes. Let's pray.